Well, if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and get that out again, please, and make your way to the New Testament, to the book of Galatians this morning. Please go in your Bible to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to be reading some passages out of there in a few minutes from now. Just keep yourself there, and I promise you we'll get to those verses in just a moment. So good to see all of you here this morning. So good to have guests with us, visitors here with us. We appreciate all of you being here. Once again, we appreciate all the wonderful mothers on this day, and we especially appreciate our Heavenly Father, who has made it possible for us to be here today to worship Him in spirit and in truth. I want to begin the lesson, the second lesson this morning, by asking a question to you. I want to know, what do you like to, what do you like to collect? What do you like to collect? Do you like to collect cars? You like classic cars? My friend, Brother Dave Sparks, he loves classic cars. You like to collect guns. You like to collect paintings, stamps, jewelry, books. Or you like my wife, and you like to collect purses. Those who, <laughs> those who know me well know that I love to collect shoes. I love to collect Sneakers. I especially love to collect Air Jordan sneakers. Here is an example of one of my favorite Air Jordan sneakers. Michael Jordan actually wore this model during the 1995-96 NBA season. I actually bought this pair of sneakers when I was living in Middle Tennessee, preaching the gospel back in 2000 in 16 or 2018 I bought another pair in 16 I, I actually found a shoe company online a sneaker company that was willing to sell me this pair for a couple of hundred dollars that is actually pretty cheap for a pair of Air Jordans once I found a company that was willing to sell me this pair for that kind of price I knew that I had to jump on that immediately I ordered this pair of classic Air Jordans, and in about a couple of weeks, they were at my house. They were right there at my front door, and so I opened the box, and I got out the sneaker, and I held it in my hands. I felt it. I smelt it. <laughs> I tried it on, and then I realized, I realized there was a problem. Let me take that back. I realized that there was some problems. Well, they do have the iconic patented leather that goes around them like they're supposed to. And, and they got the Jordan symbol there on the side and they got the, the 23 on the back. But the Jordan symbol at the bottom looks more like Shaquille O'Neal than, than Michael Jordan. And they're as light as a feather. I have several pair of Air Jordans. They're not supposed to be light as a feather. And the key test to their authenticity, the carbon fiber that's supposed to be right here on the bottom, well, this is not carbon fiber at all. This is plastic. You know what that means? These are not Air Jordans. These are not Air Jordans at all. These are fake. They are phony, they are fraudulent, they are counterfeit, they are exactly what I pay for, a cheap imitation. They are a cheap imitation. That is what I have been deceived into purchasing. And has that ever happened to you before? You ever been deceived into buying something that's counterfeit, fake, and phony, I submit that for most people in our world today, they have been deceived into doing that very thing when it comes to religion. When it comes to serving God, when it comes to serving Jesus. You see, unfortunately, while a lot of people in our society are religious today, they're not part of the right religion. They're not part of Jesus' religion. They're not part of the religion that Jesus prescribes in the Bible. They're just like the people 
that we read about in our scripture reading this morning, the people in the days of Jeroboam. Going back to our scripture reading this morning in 1 Kings 12, 25 through 33. In the context of those passages, after the kingdom of Israel divides, and after King Jeroboam, after Jeroboam was made the king of ten of the northern tribes of Israel in an effort to keep those people from going back to Jerusalem to worshiping God and returning to King Rehoboam, the Bible told us that Jeroboam invented a new religion, didn't he? Jeroboam invented a new religion for the people of Israel. He invented a religion of convenience for the people in the cities of Dan and Bethel. He invented a religion that was very similar to the religion that God had prescribed in Jerusalem. I mean, it had altars. It had sacrifices. It had feast days. It even had a priesthood. It had many of the same things you could find in the city of Jerusalem, but it still was wrong. It still wasn't the real thing. It was phony, fake, counterfeit. That's what he had deceived the people into buying. And unfortunately, again, for a lot of people in our society today, they are just like those people. They are just like the people in the days of Jeroboam. They have bought into counterfeit religion. The question is, how do we avoid that? How do we avoid counterfeit religion? How do we avoid counterfeit Christianity? Like I like real Air Jordans. And like all of us like having real money. How do we get the real Christianity that is promoted in the Bible? Well, the first thing we're going to have to do is this. If we're going to avoid counterfeit religion, then the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to get the real gospel. We're going to have to get the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you in Galatians chapter 1? Read with me, please, Galatians 1, what the apostle Paul has to say, beginning with verse number 6. In Galatians 1 and verse 6, Paul says to the Christians in Galatia, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be a curse, as we have said before. So I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you've received, he is to be a curse. Notice how these Christians here, these Christians in Galatia, were guilty of falling into the very trap they were talking about this morning. They had been guilty of falling into the trap of being deceived. They had fallen into the trap of being tricked. They had fallen into the trap of buying into counterfeit Christianity. That is exactly what happened to them once they started believing a different gospel. You see, here Paul is expressing great disappointment with these Christians because they had let false teachers fool them into believing a different gospel. A distorted gospel, a perverted gospel, a gospel that endorsed binding works of the Old Testament law of Moses as necessary to perform in order to be saved. These people have been fooled into believing a gospel that Paul says he shouldn't preach or no man should preach, or not even angels should preach. They had bought into a distorted, perverted, counterfeit gospel, and unfortunately for a lot of people in our world today, they've done the same thing. They've been fooled in the same way, like these Christians 2,000 years ago. For a lot of people today, they've been fooled by false teachers. They've been fooled by false prophets. They have been deceived into believing things that the real gospel does not teach. You see, the real gospel, the authentic gospel that you have in your hands this morning, it does not teach that Jesus came into this world so that you can be physically rich. 
It does not teach that Jesus came into this world so you can gain earthly treasures and have a lot of money in your bank account. Why, there's nothing wrong with you having a lot of money in your bank account if you earn that money in the right way. According to the real gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus didn't come into this world to make it so you could gain earthly riches. He didn't come into this world so you could be physically rich. Instead, the reason why he came into this world, according to the real gospel, is to deal with sin. It's to die for sin. It's to make it so you can have access to abundant spiritual life, not abundant physical life. The real gospel does not teach this prosperity gospel that you hear so many people preaching about today. And it also does not teach that God loves you so much and he's so infatuated with you that it doesn't matter what you believe and what you do and how you live. You're still going to go to heaven. The real gospel does not teach that. The real gospel does not teach that the path to a relationship with God is based on your feelings and you being led by your emotions. The real gospel also does not teach a need for latter day revelations. The real gospel does not teach that over time it was going to be corrupted and contaminated and we would need some fresh and new revelations from God because the other stuff just is no good anymore. No, sir, and no, ma'am. When we read the one real gospel, the gospel you have in your hands this morning, what it says is it alone is sufficient. It alone is right. It alone is all that you need to gain a relationship with God. This is why Paul told Timothy to urge people to stay away from strange doctrines. Strange doctrines are doctrines that are contrary to the one real gospel. This is why Paul also told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 to preach the word. You preach the gospel, be in season and out of season, because there's going to come a time when a lot of people are not going to be receptive to the one real gospel. They're going to have their ears tickled, Paul says. This is why John told us in 2 John 9 that if we go too far, if we don't abide to stay within the bounds of the doctrine of Christ, which is the real gospel, we don't have fellowship with God the Father or his son, Jesus Christ. This is why in Jude 3, Jude, Jude urges us to contend earnestly for the faith, which is a reference to the source of faith, which is the real gospel. We are to contend earnestly for the faith that has been once and for all revealed to the saints. All of these scriptures and so many others are emphasizing the very same thing to us. They're all telling us that there's only one gospel. There is only one real gospel. There's only one real gospel that promotes New Testament Christianity and that, promote, and that produces New Testament Christians. That is what we learn over and over again. And you know what that means? That means that contrary to what a lot of people believe today, it matters what we believe. It matters what we believe about doctrine. It matters what we believe about the gospel. It matters what we believe about God and his son, Jesus Christ. It matters what we believe, and it also matters what we do. It also matters how we live our lives every single day. It also matters how we worship God. Jesus told a religious Samaritan woman that. In John 4, 24, he told her that God is spirit. And those who worship him must do it a certain way. They must do it in spirit, from their heart, zeal, passion, concentration. They must worship in spirit and in truth. The truth there means that we got to do it a, a certain way. We got to do it according to the doctrine. We got to do it according to the pattern God has given us in his word. In our case, we got to follow that pattern given in the gospel. It matters what we believe. It matters what we do. And it also matters if we grow. It also matters if we grow in our knowledge of the one real gospel. Remember what Peter says to us in the last verse of 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3.16. What did Peter tell us to do as he closes that great book? In 2 Peter 3 verse 16, Peter says, but grow in the grace and 
knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Why does Peter tell us to grow? Well, we have to grow so we can know. So we can be able to recognize counterfeit gospels so that we can be able to recognize what the Galatian Christians should have been able to recognize 2000 years ago. This is why, listen carefully, this is why we promote daily Bible reading so much in this church. This is why we have immersed ourselves in the book of Luke. And later on, we're going to do that when it comes to the book of Acts. This is why our elders or our shepherds wants every member of this church to be here for Bible classes on Sunday morning and Wednesday nights. This is why it is so important that when you come here on Sunday, you are well rested so that you can be awake and alert and ready to listen carefully to the sermons that are given. All of this stuff, all of this stuff helps us helps us grow. It helps us know, it equips us to be able to recognize counterfeit gospels. And if we're going to avoid counterfeit Christianity, we got to get the real gospel. We got to get the real gospel, but not only do we got to get the real gospel, secondly, we got to get the real church. You got to get the real gospel and you got to get the real church. You ever heard someone say all churches are the same? You ever heard someone say it before? All churches are the same. All churches are full of Christians. All churches please Jesus. They may have some differences on doctrine, but they're all headed to the same place. They're just taking different paths to get there. You ever heard someone say it before? I have on numerous times, especially from members of my own family. The question is, is that right? Is that right? Is that real Christianity or is that mentality a promotion of counterfeit Christianity? Let's let Jesus speak on this, if you don't mind. Matthew, the 16th chapter, please. In Matthew, the 16th chapter and in verse number 18, Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 18. As he's speaking to the apostles, particularly he's speaking to Peter there in that verse. And he says in Matthew 16, 18, I also say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, I know I, I realize what kind of crowd I'm talking to this morning. I realize that the vast majority of you in here are familiar with this promise made by Jesus here. But we got to understand something. We got to understand that even though the vast majority of, of you know about this promise, the vast majority of people out there don't. They don't know this. They don't know about this promise made by Jesus. They do not know that Jesus promised to build a church. Jesus said, I will build my church. When Jesus says, I will build my church here, please understand something, okay? Please understand he's not talking about a building. Now, I understand that our society uses the word church to talk about a building, a religious meeting place, but that's not how Jesus uses the word church. That's not how the Bible uses the word church. When Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, he's not talking about a building or religious meeting place. Instead, he's talking about a people. He's talking about a congregation. He is talking about a universal body of saved people, not talking about a building, not talking about some man-made denomination like you see in our world today, not talking about some community church where you can attend that church and just feel good about yourself, and that church is going to, going to attend to all of your social needs. No, when Jesus says here, I will build my church, he means what he says. He means my church. He means his church. He means a church of Christ, a church that belongs to Christ, a church that he would bring into existence through his redemptive work at Calvary and that he would be the head of that church. Paul deals with this constantly in the book of Ephesians. Will you go in your Bible with me to Ephesians chapter 5, please? In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, we're going to look at several passages in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse number 23, Paul says this. Paul says, Ephesians 5, 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself 
being the savior of the body. So notice how Jesus promised to build a church in Matthew 16, 18. And here we see that that church is in existence. Paul is part of that church. The Ephesians are part of that church. Jesus has a church, and notice it says he is the head of that church, not the pope, not some other man or woman on the earth. He's the head of the church, and he is the savior of the church. That means that through his work on the cross, through his shedding of blood, the church comes into existence. His people, his body comes into existence. Notice how he's the savior of the body. The church is the body. You put that what you find in Ephesians 1, because Paul really wants us to get this. In Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 22, in Ephesians 1 and verse 22, Paul says, and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him, talking about Jesus, as head, head over all things to the church, which is his, it's his body, it's his spiritual body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Notice the church is the body, the body of Christ. Now you put that with Ephesians 4. Look at Ephesians 4 and verse 4. In Ephesians 4 and verse 4, Paul says there is there's one body and one spirit. Just you also were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, let me ask you something. Do you accept, do you accept what Paul is saying there in those verses, those verses in Ephesians 4? Do you accept that? Do you accept that there's only one God and Father? You accept that? You accept there's only one Lord, one Jesus Christ, one Holy Spirit, one hope, the hope of being raised from the dead and going to heaven to be with God, one faith, one source of our faith, which is the gospel. Do you accept all of that stuff this morning? I hope that you do. I believe that you do. But what about the first thing that he mentions there in that unit? What about the one body? What about the one church? You know, it is interesting to me. That while every person who claims to be a Christian today will eagerly accept that there's one God and one Lord and one faith and one hope and one Holy Spirit, while they will eagerly accept those things, they won't eagerly accept the fact that there's only one body. They won't eagerly accept the fact that there's only one church. They won't eagerly accept the fact that Jesus only built and died to establish one church. Not many different denominations. Not X church, Y church, or Z church. Not a church that's trying to blend in with the times and be socially acceptable. No, if we're going to truly accept what Paul is saying here in these verses, then guess what? We got to accept all of it. We got to take it all. We can't treat this like a buffet line. We got to accept that there's one God and Father, one Lord, one faith, one Holy Spirit, one hope, and one body. We got to accept the fact that there's only one body or one church that Jesus built and established, and it's his. It is the church that Paul was part of, that the Ephesians were part of, that every Christian in the New Testament is part of. It is the church that we can read about in our Bibles. It is the church that preaches the one gospel and worships the Lord his way and does his work as he prescribes in the one gospel. If we're going to avoid counterfeit Christianity, then we got to get the real gospel. And we got to get the real church, the church that Jesus purchased with his blood. And we also got to get the real salvation. The real salvation. This is another area where the devil has deceived people into accepting a counterfeit. You know, for some people, they believe, and you probably met people like this. They believe that if you want to be saved, then all you got to do, all you got to do is say a prayer. Just say a prayer. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me. I make you my Lord and Savior. Other people believe that if you want to be saved, you got to speak in tongues. You got to speak, some, you got to speak in tongues. You, you, you got to have some kind of emotional high or some kind of spiritual experience. Other people believe that all you got to do to be saved is just have faith. Faith only. 
Just believe in God. Just believe in Jesus. And then other people say that if you want to be saved, you don't have to do anything because guess what? God does it all. God picks who's going to be saved. God picks who's going to be lost. God predestined all of that ahead of time. And so just live however you want to live. God makes the choices. All of that is counterfeit. That's counterfeit salvation. That is not the real salvation that comes from God. You see, the real salvation, according to the one real gospel, the real salvation that comes from God starts. I emphasize the word starts. It starts by believing in Jesus. Believing the truth about Jesus, believing that he wasn't just a good guy or a great moral teacher or philosopher or rabbi who had a lot of wisdom. No, believing that he is the son of God. Believing that he is the Lord and the prophesied Messiah, as Peter talked about in Acts 2 and verse 36 believing that he's the way and the truth and the life, believing that he died on the cross for your sins, he was buried in a tomb, raised on the third day, and right now he sits at the very right hand of God, reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords. And John 8 and verse 24, Jesus said, that unless you believe that I'm he, you will die in your sins. The real salvation starts with believing the truth about Jesus, but not only must we believe in Jesus, secondly, we also got to repent. Got to repent of sin. Got to turn away from sin. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, right? Luke 13, Luke 13, 3. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will perish. You will perish spiritually. Paul told the people in Athens, this is something he really wanted them to get. And I want us to get it today also. Acts 17, remember Acts 17, 30. I'm going to Acts the 17th chapter and in verse 30, as Paul preached to the people in Athens, he said, therefore, Acts 17, 30, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men, by raising him from the dead. The Bible says it is the will of God, it is the will of God that all people across the globe repent. God wants us to repent. The idea of repenting means that we have to determine in our hearts to no longer live a life of sin. No longer we're going to live however we, we want to live, but we're going to live in the way God designed us to live. We're going to live holy. We're going to live righteously. We're going to turn away from all of the things that are wrong and a violation of his moral standard. We have to repent and we got to confess. Got to confess, not confess every sin you've ever committed in your life. Not confess your sins to a priest. Or to a preacher. No, the Bible says we must confess Jesus as Lord. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, Paul says that we must confess before men that we believe in Jesus. We believe he's the Lord. It is that confession that leads to our salvation. We must believe in Jesus, repent of sin, confess him as Lord. And we got to be baptized. We got to be baptized in water for the remission of sins. That is the one baptism that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 4 and verse 5. That's the one baptism that God wants administered today. That is the baptism that Peter commanded. In Acts 2 and verse 38 when he said repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. That is the baptism that gets us added to the Lord's church according to Acts 2 and verse number 47. That is the baptism that Paul was commanded to do by Ananias in Acts 22 and verse 16 when Ananias said, why are you waiting to rise and get baptized having your sins washed away? That is the baptism that Peter's talking about. 
In 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, when he says baptism now saves us, that is the baptism that Jesus talks about in Mark 16 and verse 16 when he says he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Believing in Jesus, repenting of sin, confession of Jesus as Lord, and being baptized for your forgiveness of sins, that is how the one gospel says you gain access to real salvation. That's the real thing. That's the authentic thing. That's the path to true Christianity, not counterfeit Christianity. If we're going to avoid counterfeit Christianity, you've got to get the real gospel, the real church, the real salvation. And then finally, let me say this finally, you've got to get some real love. You've got to get some real love for Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Do you love? Do you love Jesus? Do you really love Jesus Christ? You know, a lot of people are quick to say, I love Jesus. They're quick to say, Jesus means everything to me. I'll do anything for Jesus. Many people are quick to say that, but they fail to consider what Jesus says true love for him demands. And so what does Jesus say about real love? A simple verse, John 14, 15. You know the verse, don't you? John 14, 15. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will do what? You'll keep my commandments. That's the key to loving Jesus. Jesus says the key to loving him is obedience. It is obedience to the commandments of God. It is commitment, dedication, loyalty. Jesus says that real love for him is rooted in obedience to his will. And so now that we know that, let me ask again, does that describe you? Do you love Jesus? Do you really love Jesus? Do you love Jesus in the way that he demands? Do you love him enough to submit to his gospel and only his gospel? Do you love him enough to be a member of his church and only a member of his church? Do you love him enough to be connected with members of his church and to serve members of his church and to love members of his church? Do you love him enough to obey his plan of salvation? Do you love him enough to repent? Do you love him enough to confess him as the Lord? Do you love him enough to be baptized for the remission of sins? Do you love him enough to go beyond making mom happy by just coming to church with her today? Or just coming to church on Easter, but to assemble every first day of the week to worship him? Do you love him enough to worship him according to the pattern that he gives us in the gospel and not be so arrogant to add things to the worship that you think he might like or that you think he might be OK with? Do you love him enough to be his disciple beyond the worship assembly? Do you love him enough to live for him and be faithful to him and keep his commandments and put him first in every aspect of your life every day. I submit that if you're not willing to do every single one of those things, then you don't have real love for Jesus. You don't have the kind of love he's talking about there in that verse. You're no different than these people we read about in Matthew chapter 7. One more place, and then we're going to get ready to close. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, and we look at verse 21. And Matthew 7 and verse 21, Jesus said, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. As we pointed out, and our final Sermon on the Mount class a couple of days ago, these passages here are Judgment Day passages. 
These are judgment day verses. These are verses that tell us exactly who's going to be saved and exactly who's going to be lost. They tell us that the only people who are going to be saved in the end, the only people who are going to go to heaven are those who have done something. Verse 21, only those who do the will of the Father. Jesus says that's the only people that's going to be saved. Only the people who do the will of the Father. According to Jesus, anything outside of that, anything outside of the will of the Father that is put here in the Bible, it is wrong. It is fraudulent. It is not a demonstration of true love for God. Now, it may be sincere. It may make you feel good. It may even be religious, but it's wrong. It's not authentic in the eyes of God. It is fake and phony. It is counterfeit and false, just like those Air Jordans I got four years ago. And so, what do you have? What do you have right now? Are you part of the real Christianity? Are you part of counterfeit Christianity? If you're currently part of counterfeit Christianity, I want you to know something. You are not part of Christianity at all. And so it's time for you to get the real thing. It's time to get the real thing right here and right now. It's time to obey the real gospel. It's time to be part of the real church. It's time to obey the real plan of salvation. And it's time to start showing some real love for God. And if we can help you with that in any way, come to the front right now. Let's stand. Let's sing together.